Tudum sisters, allies, and loved ones, welcome to As Told by Charles Women, an oral history series that ushers our stories into the permanent archives of global history where they have always belonged. I'm your host, Jody Tyson, and the founder of Tudum Global, a media platform for Charles Women. And when I first envisioned this series, I knew I wanted to take an active role in documenting the involuntary Charles Women narratives and the Charles experience. As a researcher, I know too well that archives have the power to preserve community memory and influence individual identity. Today's episode gives voice to endometriosis and medical menopause. Behind every woman, there's a story. And today's guest, Brandy Lytle, hailing from South Carolina, is bravely sharing hers with us. Hey, Brandy, thank you so much for joining us. Hi, Joby. Thank you so much for asking me. Yes, just so everyone knows, I know Brandy. Brandy was the first person in the industry of the Chalice movement that I reached out to, and she's always embraced me and um, just been so genuine. So I'm very honored to have you here today, Brandy. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Firstly, I just like you to just tell everyone who you are. Um, well, as Joby said, I'm Brandy Lytle. I do live in South Carolina. I live with my husband, Dane, and our fur baby, Maddie. Um, she's seven years old. We have been remodeling our house for about four years and are almost done with that. So that's very exciting. Um, and my husband has some new ventures on the horizon with business. So that's exciting as well. So I like to always start these conversations from the beginning. So as best as you can, I just like you to walk us through your journey from the beginning. Sure, absolutely. Um, well, my husband and I were married in 2000, and in 2003, we decided that it was the perfect time to go ahead and grow our family. We had a house, um, which had a room that could be a nursery. I was getting ready to graduate with my master's degree, um, and so it just seemed like it was time for us to go ahead and start trying. And I know a lot of people probably don't remember the exact moment they started trying, but you know, ours was actually on November the 10th. And I remember that was because it was exactly one month from when we would celebrate our three year anniversary. Mm -hmm. um, for some reason, we decided to keep it a secret. I think we thought it would be more exciting to announce that we were you know, going to have a little one instead of just announcing that we were trying. But six months after we started trying, nothing was happening. And so my husband and I talked and decided it'd be okay to tell family um, and close friends that we were we were trying. So we did that and more months went by, um, I think it was a couple of years and still nothing had happened. And we had been using an ovulation predictor kit. Um, I had talked to my OBGYN who had done an HSG and she just really thought nothing was the matter with me. Um, she kept telling me she thought the problem must be on my husband's end because she said I was healthy. But we did go to a fertility specialist because as I said, nothing was happening. And we were in our late twenties at this time. I was uh, 28 probably at that point and Dane was 30. So um, we didn't feel like, you know, we should be struggling. Mm -hmm. And after having conversations with the infertility doctor and filling out the extensive paperwork, um, he is the first person who told me that he thought I had endometriosis. Mm -hmm. Now, my husband does have some male factor um, infertility problems as well, but I always let him tell his side of the story and I just focus on my medical issues. So the doctor suggested that I have surgery and Dane and I decided that that would be best um, to go ahead and get me healthy before we started any treatment. So I had the surgery and um, the doctor also suggested after surgery that I be put on a medication called Lupron. Well, let me, let um, me, let me interject yes, real quick. What was the yes. purpose for the surgery? Okay, so the purpose of the surgery was he said that he needed to get rid of the endometriosis so that my uterus could be as healthy as possible so that hopefully when we did treatments, um, that it would actually implant. Mm -hmm. And I should say while he was in there, he did, um, there was a lot of scar tissue. It, uh, the endometriosis was wrapped around my appendix and it caused scar tissue. And so he went ahead and removed my appendix 
because he said I was likely to have issues um, with it and have to have surgery to remove it anyways. So he just went ahead and got rid of it while he was in there. Okay. And then after surgery, he said, you know, endometriosis, there's no cure for endometriosis. So he said he could have left behind microscopic cells that would grow back. And so he suggested the Lupron, which put me into medical menopause for six months, to, which he said would hopefully help slow the growth. Um, and for me personally, being thrown into medical menopause via medication was a hundred times worse than going through menopause naturally. Really? I'm only I'm only 43, but I went through menopause a year or two ago, which is about 10 years before the average. Um, and I mean, I really I felt bad when I was going through menopause, and I have to be honest. At first, I didn't know what was happening because I was only in my early 40s, and so I didn't really expect to be going through it. But when I was in medical menopause, you know, they talk about hot flashes. I didn't have hot flashes. I was hot all the time. And I had headaches every single day. I craved chocolate. I gained like 15 pounds um, because I had a chocolate shake every day because it's the only thing that made me happy. <laughs> um, and actually, my last shot, I I cried. And my husband told me just do this so that you can get healthy so that we can get pregnant um because i didn't i did not want to do it i did not want that medication in my body anymore um but i went through it and we went through three rounds of intrauterine insemination iui and it didn't work i i never was able to conceive so we took a bit of a break and then my endometriosis was getting bad again um, because honestly, after my surgery, I had no idea how much pain I was in. People would, you know, doctors will ask, what's your pain? Is it normal? Well, it was normal for me. I didn't know that you could have a period without having so much pain. And so as my endometriosis started coming back and my pain started coming back, I realized what was happening. My OBGYN, I had moved at the time. My new OBGYN sent me to a fertility specialist because, you know, supposedly that was the only person who could handle the endometriosis. And Dana and I had kind of decided that we weren't going to do any more treatments, but they told us about a trial. And so we could get, it was either three or four more rounds of IUI um, for free if we did this trial. And so we did it and I was never able to conceive. Um, and so then we... We looked at all different kinds of adoption, domestic, international, through child services, even embryo adoption. Ultimately, nothing ever felt right for both of us. And so at the end of 2013, Dane asked if uh, we could please accept our life as it was um, without kids. And uh, initially, I was devastated when he asked that. We had been trying for 10 years, and I did not understand why after all that effort um we would in my eyes we would just give up yeah. uh since then i have accepted the fact that i feel like we just let go of one dream so that we could embrace another life um and you know that eventually led to me starting not so mommy and meeting amazing childless women like you thank you so much for sharing that brandy can you explain is um, what is IUI? Yes, uh, intrauterine insemination is, so I monitored my ovulation um, and I would go in and they would see if, you know, I had enough follicles and such. And then we would go to the clinic and they, Dane would provide his sample and then they would um, insert that into my uterus as high as possible and the hope that um, I would be able to get pregnant. So it's not as complicated as IVF, and it doesn't have as good of success rates. I've learned a lot since starting Not So Mommy. Um, a lot of people feel that it's kind of a waste of money because the, the stats, and I'm sorry, I don't know exactly what they are um, off the top of my head, aren't great. Okay. But uh, at the time, 
that's what we were comfortable with doing and trying. And so that's what we did. Okay. And just so everyone knows, endometriosis is a disorder in which the tissue that normally lines the uterus grows outside the uterus. Mm -hmm. And as a researcher, it would be remiss if I didn't share some stats um, for endometriosis. It affects one in 10 reproductive individuals and reproductive age individuals and an estimated 200 million women worldwide. It is one of the leading causes of infertility and there is a seven to 10 year delay in diagnosis. And the longer these lesions or related issues last or go untreated, the higher the risk of infertility. And although like Brandy mentioned, there is no cure for endometriosis, there are various treatments to help manage it. Have you um, had any treatments to help manage your endometriosis? Um, when I when I go to the doctor, you know, they will suggest birth control. Um, for me personally, it was very difficult for me to get off birth control the first time. And then, as I said, the Lupron um, was very difficult as well. So I have chosen not to do any synthetic hormones, even since uh, menopause. Mm -hmm. um, my husband did a lot of research. He has an undergrad in biology and he really enjoys researching. And we have found um, supplements, vitamins, things of that nature to help balance my hormones. Okay. Um, maintaining uh, my stress level is helpful. Um, I've been having a flare for over a month now and stress induces that. Um, I have found that it often, my endometriosis often kicks up in September. I lost my best friend. She passed away that month. And um, it seems like uh, the stress of that seems to cause flare ups. And once I have one, it's hard for me to get rid of it. Um, but exercise, plenty of rest and eating the right things. I mentioned that I love those chocolate shakes, but the sugars and carbohydrates for me personally, um, they really cause endo belly, which is uh, it's a bloated belly um, and it's it can be really painful doctors don't talk about it a whole lot but the endometriosis community does um, and so I, I try to manage mine naturally okay. I my doctor and I did talk about a hysterectomy I was very close to saying yes I wanted to go ahead and do that but the only issue I had was she wasn't guaranteeing she wouldn't take my ovaries and I really didn't want at that time I was kind of perimenopausal and I didn't want to be thrown into menopause overnight yeah. and so I Dane and I talked and we decided to wait my flare calmed um, and now I just try to manage them as best I can if my pain gets too bad you know I may revisit that with her okay so I have one more question about, about endometriosis and I want to dig a little deeper into medical menopause. Yes, so you just mentioned flare-ups. Can you um, explain to us what, what their, the flare-ups are? Is that the same as endo pain? Um, yeah, I guess it could be. For me, when I say I have a flare-up, I am having endo pain. Like right now, my lower back on the right-hand side, there's a little bit of a dull ache. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, it's just kind of been there for a while. And I think this, the stress of this year and all the things that are going on, um, it, it just seems to settle in my back and I have that endometriosis pain. Um, and then for me, when I have a flare, um, that, that endo belly is another thing that I end up getting. I've really been watching what I'm eating lately to try to keep that um, calm and at bay. Yeah, and so many people don't realize that there are stages to endometriosis. There are the milder stages, which is stage one, and then it goes all the way to more extreme stage four. So let's get into medical menopause, which is an induced menopause when the woman stops producing eggs and her menstrual cycle ceases permanently due to certain medical treatments, which they did for you. Was it abruptly right after um, you were given this medication that you your um, menopause was induced or did it happen over time? Well, I was on Lupron for six months and um, as 
as best as I can recall in terms of when my period stopped was they stopped fairly quickly after they started giving me the medicine. Now the menopause symptoms got worse over time. And uh, like I think I mentioned, I was just hot all the time. I had headaches every single day. My emotions were all over the place. Um, it was just, it was a really, really hard six months. And then once you came off and your body was allowed to, to start working naturally again, my periods came back in a couple of months, but we had to wait just a little bit before we could do IUI. Because the one thing is, is when you're on Lupron, you need to be very careful because the doctor warned you do not want to get pregnant when you're on Lupron because it could cause some serious issues mm -hmm. with the fetus. Okay. And so how have you been psychologically impacted by your experiences and childlessness? Um, well, I would say when I was in the middle of my infertility battle, I did not fully understand that I was grieving. And as I have connected with other childless women in this community, I've learned that all those emotions that I had, other people have them and um, there was nothing wrong with it. And I wasn't weird or strange or different. Um, I mean, I remember sitting on the bathroom floor, just crying and asking the question why, because I couldn't understand you know, why this was happening to me. Um, and I felt so isolated. And I know many, many women talk about that. Now that I understand that it's a grieving process, and honestly, that I still have times where I'm going to grieve and where those emotions are going to happen, and I understand that that's okay, um, I think I'm able to process it better and maybe a little quicker and be kinder to myself um, about what I'm feeling and going through. So with that being said, how do you cope with childlessness? Well, one of the ways uh, I, when I was in my infertility battle, I liked to write. I, it was way back in the day of just emails and I would write emails to my mom and my aunt. And, um, so not so mommy and my blog, it's almost like journaling and that really helps me process emotions. Um, I have learned that it's okay to sleep in endometriosis causes chronic fatigue and i used to just i used to wonder why am i so tired like i you know i sleep in on saturday why am i so tired and once i figured out it was part of a disease that i have i was kinder to myself about that um i said i'm watching what i eat and i do however if i really want that piece of chocolate, I'll allow myself to have it and yeah. not beat myself up over that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, simple things like going and getting a pedicure, um, attending my aerials class, uh, working on my photos, just doing things that bring me joy so that I can kind of manage that stress and, um, you know, just allow my mind, my body, my soul a moment to rest. So with the social stigma attached to female childlessness, what has been your experience existing in the world as a childless woman? Uh, for the most part now, I, I guess I'm, I've accepted my journey. Um, it is still surprising to me sometimes the comments or the negativity that people will bring into your space. Um, I've even had a couple of family members who have been not understanding at all uh, about Dane and I's choices um, and the letting go and the deciding to not have children. They just, they can't seem to accept that. They feel like this decision was forced on me and um, it wasn't, I mean, I, we talked about things. Yes, I'm childless, not by choice due to infertility, but Dana and I did talk and we did decide that we were going to stop treatment, that we weren't going to pursue adoption. 
and that we were just going to try to accept this life. And I, I guess it's frustrating when I've accepted it, but other people won't accept it. Um, I know I, I wrote a blog one time called, please stop trying to fix my childlessness. Mm. You know, once somebody accepts, um, whether you, you like it or not, <laughs> it, just accept it because it, it's hard enough yeah. without the judgments of others. And you mentioned there was a 10 year journey, correct? Yes. So that's a very long time. And I wouldn't consider that giving up at all. Thank you. <laughs> A lot of times, you know, I do studies and mm -hmm. when we look back on our symptoms and all of the things that come in, involved in it and you have any endometriosis in the end, what, what were the clues or symptoms that you had before that could help someone else that may be having endometriosis and with this seven to 10 delay may help them for expedite that? Where were the symptoms now that you look back? Well, when doctors ask, is your pain normal? I think that maybe as individuals, we should explain what our pain is a little bit more. I always just said, yes, it was fine. You know, everybody has cramps. Um, but, you know, I had pain in my lower back. Um, my stomach has never been flat. I've always had a bit of a bloat since I was in about seventh grade which if you think about it would be about the time that you started uh, with your cycle. Um, and you know, is pain normal? Well, I used to have cramps so bad that I would moan mm -hmm. and have to take medicine, have to have a heating pad. So, I mean, that doesn't really seem normal. Uh, and you know, the heaviness of your cycle as well, you know, is your cycle, is your bleeding normal? We don't like to talk about these things, even with our doctors. We don't like to go into such detail, but, you know, we need to pay attention. How many days of a heavy cycle are we having? How long is our cycle? That way, when doctors ask these questions, we can give a little bit more detail. Um, and if you feel or think that something is wrong, just keep bothering them or go to a different doctor or keep asking questions advocate for yourself um until you get the answers that you need and deserve that sounds good knowing what you know now what piece of advice would you give to your 20 year old self you know i that is a, it's a hard question because i think you know should you tell your 20 year old self please don't go through this 10 year battle, just, you know, accept and move on because that 10 year battle is part of what made me who I am today. I think that I would let her know, um, nothing is, don't be so hard on yourself. You're not doing anything wrong. Uh, I, I am a high strung person. And so when we were in our battle and people would tell me to just relax, or, you know, I even had someone one time tell me that they had gone to a psychic and the psychic had, you know, seen me with children and they had asked this person, well, what do you think the problem is? Mm -hmm. And she had said, well, I, I really think that Brandy is too worried about it. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I, I worry that I'm too worried, which then causes me to worry more. That does not help yeah. anybody. Yeah. So just not not listening to other people and understanding that how you're feeling is okay. And the decisions you make, you're making the best decisions you can with the knowledge that you have and really people's, it doesn't matter. Absolutely. And I firmly believe that with or without children, we all have meaning and purpose in our lives. But I also, I first like to ask you what brings you happiness? Ah, uh, um, there are silly things that bring me happiness. Like right now, pumpkins. I love pumpkins and I have them all over my house. Um, I love the color pink. And as I have gotten older, I have just embraced mm -hmm. that uh, pink is my color. Mm -hmm. um, I do love dark chocolate. So I indulge in that. Okay. And then spending time with my husband and Maddie, 
our our Pomeranian, she brings me a lot of joy and happiness. Mm -hmm. And uh, connecting with others, um, connecting with other childless women, and just being able to talk openly about all of this and being able to be validated, um, that also brings me a lot of joy. That's good. How, how have you figured out your life's purpose, if you have? Uh, I think that that was just a process of just trying various things. Um, I, I really, I taught for 17 years and I felt like that was my calling. But at, at the end of it, at 17 years, I felt like I had fulfilled that purpose. And so then I started my blog and I felt like I had a new purpose and a new reason for going through all of this and sharing it with people. Um, and I think to find your life purpose, you just have to keep searching and trying and redefine things. If something doesn't work, um, I guess truly, I feel like my purpose is just to live my best life and to just try to help others um, find their joy and show them that it's possible even when life doesn't turn out like you had expected or wanted. Mm -hmm. So Not So Mommy blog is one of the first blogs that I found and was very helpful to my growth in coping with childlessness. Tell us a little bit about Not So Mommy blog. Well, honestly, it started because of my husband. Mm -hmm. um, we were talking one day and he was like, there's got to be other people out there like us. You know, you should write a blog and you could call it Not So Mommy. And mm -hmm. I kind of chuckled and I was like, that's a good idea. Mm -hmm. And I got home from teaching that evening and he's like, I brought the, I bought the URL for NotSoMommy.com. <laughs> uh, and it took a while um, for me to really get it going. Uh, but I did in 2017 and you know i really I, I didn't know if anybody would read my blog and i have just been amazed at how many people have found it and reached out and at the community that has grown you know on social media and on the blog site and like i said i i felt like i was pretty far along on my healing journey when i started my blog but through blogging um i've learned even more about my childless journey and just the childless journey in general. Um, it's been a really amazing experience. So tell us about the olive ribbon and the purpose behind that. Well, when I started Not So Mommy and started blogging, I learned about things like Endometriosis Awareness Month. Um, and I started sharing ribbons, like the yellow ribbon for endometriosis. And ladies were saying, we should have a ribbon for childless, not by choice. And I did some research and there wasn't one. And I did some research about how, how a ribbon comes about. And it basically said anybody could um, develop a ribbon and then you know just advertise it or let people know about it you know bring awareness to it and so i did some research and olive green um when i researched i really didn't find anything else that had olive green and then just the symbolism of self-love and community it really sounded like our tribe and so i created the olive green childless not by choice awareness ribbon and started sharing it and it's really been amazing. Um, you know, I was scrolling through Instagram one day and I was like, wait a second, there's the ribbon. And I am not the one who had posted it. Somebody else had shared the ribbon. And so I think that's just amazing um, to see it out there and to see people displaying it so that others can learn more about what it really means to be a childless person. Absolutely. And can you sh share with everyone how they can find Not So Mommy? Yes, um, it's notsomommy.com. And I am also on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Pinterest. And you can find me at Not So Mommy. Well, thank you so much, Brandy, for sharing your story with us. Do you have any last words or anything I missed that you want to discuss? Oh, I just want everybody to um, just find your joy and... Uh, just make sure that you feel all the feels and, you know, grieve if you need to, 
but I do hope that you find acceptance and that you're able to embrace the what is and move forward. Well, thank you so much, Brandy, for your time. Thank see you. you. Childless woman, you're beautiful. Child-free woman, you are enough. This journey might not be easy, but we're in this together so we can get through this together by owning our voice. Thank you for your time and attention today. Please like, subscribe, share, and download this episode. From Tudum Global, I'm your host, Joby Tyson. See you next time on As Told by Childless Women. To support this series, please visit astoldbychildlesswomen.com.